For thousands of years, civilization has been a destructive force, both ecologically and culturally. Deep in the abyss of the sixth extinction, the future of humanity and our other-than-human kin hangs by a thread. At this pivotal moment in time, we must reach back into the depths of the human story and uncover our mistakes. I invite you to go with me down the rabbit hole as I seek out the silenced, forgotten, buried, abandoned, and demonized stories and practices of regenerative, egalitarian, place-based cultures. There is still time to reconnect with what we have lost, to restore our broken relationships to the land where we dwell, and to remember the human place in the wild. Welcome to the Rewilding Podcast, episode 20, Patron Prompts. Today I'm going to be going through a few of the patron prompts that I've received. If you're unfamiliar, uh, my patrons ask me questions and I answer them in a podcast. So I'm going to answer a bunch of questions today and get a little bit caught up. My question list is getting longer and longer. Thank you so much for engaging with me. I love getting questions and especially challenging questions. So uh, this one actually is going to be probably a bunch of softball questions. Um, Who knows what it'll end up turning into, but I don't, I didn't necessarily feel uh, like it would be complicated to answer these or, or challenging to talk about. So um, yeah, but they're all really important questions, even though they're not uh, super challenging in terms of clarifying what I mean by things. So the first one is, what is your advice for people just beginning on their rewilding journeys? This is a a question that I dislike answering because I don't like to give prescriptions. I don't like to give prescriptions of what rewilding should be to anybody other than how to clarify what rewilding means and using it as a worldview with which then all actions fall under. So how do you see the world and then how to move in it are two different things. When I talk about rewilding, I'm talking about a lens for perceiving the world around us, a narrative, a mythology, um, and how you enact that mythology is going to be much more individualistic, especially because the complexity of where everyone lives, what their intersectionality of uh, traumas and oppressions and privileges and all of those things is going to be so complex and different from anybody that if I were to give any advice, it would probably be coming from my own experience. And my own experience is that I'm a white male, uh, you know, who grew up in the liberal white Portland, Oregon. So, you know, probably a lower middle class growing up. Now, I don't even know how to classify myself. <laughs> I'm maybe just on the poverty spectrum. Um, so what I would have to offer would not apply to people in multiple realities that, that they're living in. Um, I can say for sure like a kind of top five areas that i encourage people to explore in terms of resilience and adaptability and so that's where i'll that's what i'll cover um the first thing is relationship building so you know, a friend of mine asked once, like, do you think that there will ever be like a, a mutual aid economy kind of a thing, like a kinship based gift economy? And I thought about it for a while and I was like, you know what, it already, it already exists. Um, it's just that there's this external force placed on top of everybody that prevents us from sharing more because we're giving into this larger system. Um, through taxation, through rent, through things like, you know, all of our bills and stuff, the money that it costs for us to simply exist is all getting funneled into the state. 
prior to the state, those funds were distributed among communities, oftentimes in non-hierarchical manners, and sometimes even in hierarchical manners, but distributed more evenly than what we see today. So that economy is essentially the baseline of human behavior. I don't know if economy is even the right word. The community, the culture, the, the way we make a living together is essentially through various forms of sharing. And that exists. Uh, I don't think it exists as much in like white communities in the United States as it does in other communities here and in around the world. But I think it is the baseline for human connection and interaction and livelihood. So with that in mind, the question then, you know, how do you rewild our kinship? It begins with sharing. Um, it begins with expanding your social network. And to do so, you know, that requires some social skills in how to interact and engage with other people. One of the things, you know, I was asked this question years ago, what are your top five things for rewilding? And, you know, I try to make them as generic and vague as possible so that anyone can ap can apply these. And the first thing I said was like stockpile of relationships. So the more relationships you have, the more interconnectedness you have, and, and relationships are built on a couple of things. They're built on not just interacting with people, but shared experience, trust, and sharing of food. At specifically those kinds of things. So um, shared experience are where people tend to connect most. So there's, you know, this sort of larger scope of, hey, we're all human. Um, and we all share the human experience, but not everybody shares it evenly, right? And I think one of the challenges in that, that the left has come up against in the last decade or so is that in order to um, get resources from the state, you have to compete with one another with your identity for who allegedly needs it more. And so what that does is it immediately creates um, not a shared experience between uh, oppressed groups, but it makes them try to figure out how they are not sharing an experience and which one is more unique in what ways. Um, and it's essentially that they're forced to do that in order to compete for, you know, they call it, uh, the oppression Olympics or something, you know, who's, who's more oppressed, who's more traumatized. And that's because those are the groups that are going to get resources handed to them from the state, not handed to them, but you know what I mean? Uh, distributed on some level to those people who can make the case that they need it the most. And so what it does is it creates automatic division instead of automatic unity. I think the last time we really saw a form of unity, even if it was problematic and had its own challenges, uh, was David Graeber's phrase, we are the 99%, which unified the majority of people against capitalism. Um, unfortunately, you know, that Occupy movement was shut down. And now I don't think anybody wants to think about how they're connected and how they are the 99%. But, you know, that's, again, because there's these challenges that are being presented to us and in terms of competing for resources. So that just becomes super challenging because it's a, a state framework. Anyway, we could go down a whole rabbit hole with that. I'm not interested in going down that rabbit hole right now. But that said, the idea of shared experience, we are the 99%. We are all, uh, you know, subjects of the state to some extent. That's the shared experience that we have. That's where we can build our connection, which then build our trust. And then in thinking in terms of privileges, it's really just thinking about what do you have in excess to give and what and who needs it? And then being able to create that share, the actual sharing of resources. Um, so it's an interesting challenge I think we're all facing, but stockpiling relationships is the number one thing because... Um, you might not know how to do something, but somebody else knows how to do that. You might not have the resources to make something happen, but somebody else has those resources to give. And if we create more social ties and connections, that's what distributes resources more evenly is the social network. Um, and if, you know, as collapse intensifies, it's going to be more and more important to have larger and tighter social networks that are providing um, and distributing resources amongst each other. So I just think about, you know, making friends and building community as 
the most central theme of rewilding because oftentimes in the United States, there's this, you know, individualistic mythology that uh, there was this individual on the frontier pioneering forward or whatever, which di- wasn't even true when that was happening, when when colonization was um, initial in, being initialized or whatever on this continent. There was never this indi- individual um, against nature. That was a mythology created later. Uh, but anyway, uh, because of that mythology, people tend to think about building themselves up and building their own skills up, which is absolutely important and fun and necessary. But I think it's there's way too much uh, weight put on making yourself into some sort of survival expert or whatever, you know, rather than building a community of people interested in these things and each one kind of being able to have a sort of specialization while everybody has some sort of generalization and then being able to um, meet the needs across a community instead of each person having to be their own island of skills and survival knowledge and resources. I think that's the number one thing um, is just community building. And it's not as sexy and glamorous as like getting really good at skills yourself. Building a community isn't something that you can like show off to other people. It's not necessarily narcissistic if you're not building yourself up as the, you know, whatever central figure of a community, um, which I'm definitely slightly hypocritical of in that sense, just as the director of Rewild Portland. Um, But I think of myself more as a spokesperson for the community than I do um, some sort of hierarchical leader or something, even though that's not necessarily true. There's definitely like a lot of um, influence that I have in terms of the community because I'm the one who started it. But, um, you know, that's sort of, to me, I try to envision myself more as a catalyst than a quote unquote leader, a catalyst for community rather than the leader of a community. And um, the more I the more I work on community building, the more I focus on that of being able to set something up and then work as a team once there's enough people on board. And Rewild Portland at this point is certainly a team, um, if you know, including all of our staff and board of directors who um, make up the organization. And then, of course, the community members that contribute in all these other ways. So stockpiling relationships, number one. Uh, number two... The next thing I think is important is just subsistence. So understanding, um, you know, and and there's a couple of tiers within subsistence. There's like wild foods, quote unquote, wild foods. um, And there's gardening. And then there's like hunting and raising animals and stuff, right? Like there's this definite distinction in terms of skill between plants and animals and how to go about getting those resources or those living things to contribute to your existence. Um, and just kind of getting to know your food, how to do all those things, um, is going to be super important. And you can start in any one of those areas. If you don't have any land to garden, you can start by foraging in an urban environment or in a rural environment. If you do have land to garden, you can start by doing some of that. Um, I tend to focus on caloric intake because when, um, If we're looking at a collapse, the most important thing isn't going to be the dandelion leaves growing in your lawn. You know, most of these edible wild food guide books are not based on calories. They're just based on things you can eat. That's not to say that there aren't important micronutrients in dandelion leaves or whatever greens that are out there. But for subsistence and long-term (laughs) non-starvation, to not starve to death, you need calories. So when you're thinking about subsistence, that's where I think, you know, everybody should focus on that initially is just calories. If you watch shows like Alone, you know, um, I jokingly call it the starvation show because it's 10 contestants go out by themselves in the wilderness and whoever doesn't starve to death (laughs) or isn't starving to death the most wins a half a million dollars. And it basically the game is just how long can you not starve to death? And everybody there is starving the whole time, even when some of them are getting a lot of food. Um, you know, a couple of the last seasons have had some really amazing winner, quote unquote, winners of the show. 
um, who were able to take out big game and get a lot of fat. And that's where the calories are. That's going to prevent starvation. And that's why they won. Um, or they had a lot of body fat going in or both. So where is the, where is the calories when you start thinking about subsistence? Um, and that's going to be in like the starchy carbohydrate, sugars, um, fruits, you know, and especially fats. So animal fats are going to be the highest form of calories. Um, and that's going to be something hard to find in a, in an environment unless, um, you know what those things are and every environment's going to be different. So that is something to start thinking about and considering caloric foods. My favorite one, if to just throw it out there is the acorn. So acorns are, um, really high in both protein, fat, and carbohydrates. They're a really great mixture of all of those things. Um, the one challenge with acorns is that they do take, uh, well, there's two things. One is that they take a lot of water to process. Um, so you have to leach out the tannins. And the second part is they have what's called mast years. So you never know what year you're going to get a, a large acorn crop. It's completely unpredictable. No botanist has ever figured out when and why acorns will or oak trees are going to have a mast year, which is just the year that they overproduce acorns or, or have a large production of acorns. It's generally every two, anywhere between two to seven years. Um, it's the reason why it's not a state food is because it's unpredictable and states in order to maintain their power like predictability so they want you know a certain number of grain to be grown every year and when you're growing annual grains you can produce that kind of predictability so long as their soil isn't do you know eroding um and climate's relatively stable you can kind of produce the same amounts every year which is why the states have always relied on uh, agricultural grain product. So if you're looking into wild foods or even just, you know, um, tending the wild acorns are a great place to start and it's just past season for them. But if you start reading up on them and scouting them right now and thinking about where the oak trees are in your area, and maybe even thinking about like assisted migration, like, you know, it takes about 50 years for an oak tree to start really producing acorns on a large scale. So if you start thinking about that, then you could start thinking about, um, you know, and climate change is warming areas. Maybe uh, assisted migration is when animals and uh, basically when animals assist in the migration of plants to warmer climates. So um, what we're seeing right now, for example, is oak trees from California are migrating north into the valley, which never held those species before. And in part, that migration is being assisted through jays and squirrels that are carrying those acorns further north and planting them in the ground and then either forgetting about them or getting killed before they have the opportunity to go back and eat them um, through predation of, you know, other predators or, you know, like coyotes and things like that. So we can also, as humans, assist migration through planting some of these things. So when I talk about subsistence, it's not just um, what you can and cannot eat, but also how to grow it, how it fits into a larger ecosystem, how to maintain. So, you know, basically looking at foraging more as a stewardship type thing. Uh, and I'm going to talk about my favorite books later on in this, and we'll talk, we'll circle back around to that. So number one, stockpile relationships. Number two, start learning about subsistence and in particular caloric subsistence what are the things that have calories in the environment how what, what can you grow in your backyard or anywhere or in the wild spaces around you um, that's going to start to add more caloric density to that environment the third thing is basically start to make things with your hands learn how to make something it could be anything if you like knitting, keep knitting, start knitting. Uh, if you like basket weaving, like me, I'm a basket weaver, so weaving is the main thing that I'm, I've am i been doing. If you like wood carving, you can carve wood. Um, I think the main component of any craft applies across the board. So the more you enjoy a craft and focus and specialize on it, the more you're actually going to be better at everything that you do with your hands. So it doesn't really matter what it is that you pick because all of it's going to relate back to 
ancestral technology in some form or another. Uh, and each one is going to teach you uh, muscle memory, body mechanics. Uh, it's going to teach you spatial awareness of objects. It's going to teach you, you know, sculpting, essentially. Um, and each one of those things will connect you to, if you're using natural materials, which I recommend, um, you're going to start connecting to your place. If you can go out and harvest the materials that you're using for your project, whatever that project is, even better, right? Um, and so like an example is my basket weaving classes that I teach here in Portland. Um, they're not just basket weaving, they're basket making. And that's because, you know, if we were to just weave a basket out of materials that we purchased online that were shipped here a thousand miles or more, um, those are that's just basket weaving. That's an important aspect of basket making. You have to know how to weave a basket. You have to know the particular weaves and the instructions, but basket making is everything from scratch. So you're going out, you're harvesting the materials, you're harvesting them in a way that you know is either going to be regenerative to the landscape or is affecting the landscape in some way that um, will act as a regenerative quality. So when I go out to harvest, I'm collecting invasive species. Um, and invasive species are not actually invasive. They're prolific because of the damaged soils that are already here because of civilization. So English ivy, the, the material I work with the most, isn't uh, an aggressive plant that's taking over everything. English ivy is adapted to the damaged soils that exist here now after logging. And so it, quote unquote, takes over because the soil is allowing that to happen. The microbiome in the soil determines what species can grow in it. And once a soil has been damaged in a particular way, we see proliferation of plants that are adapted to that kind of disturbance. So if we were to replant an area with native plants, they might stay, uh, but more likely they're going to die over the next couple of years, 20, 30, and it'll be replaced with species that are adapted to that kind of damaged soil. So it's a really interesting thing. This is all in that a book called Beyond the War on Invasive Species, which again, I'm going to read off my favorite books later. But so when I go out, I harvest ivy. I'm actually acting as a predator for a plant that is so prolific and has no predation on it that I'm helping to sort of counter the balance of its proliferation and maybe make a little bit of room for native plants to get them some time to adapt to the damaged and disturbed soils that exist here now, if that's ever possible. Um, but then I'm also connecting with the landscapes that I go to. I'm learning where these materials come from. I'm digging my hands in the dirt. I'm getting outside. I'm doing all of these things. I'm physically active. Um, there's just so much to kind of, that can come from, um, doing a craft from start to finish, including the harvesting. And if that's not something that you can do right away, don't sweat it. You know, if you want to buy, um, you know, synthetic yarn to do a knitting project. I'm not judging, right? Everything that you can do to get your hands mo moving. Um, you could you, you could raise sheep and harvest the wool and dye the wool with plants that you've gathered and spin it into yarn and then knit something, you know? Um, that, that's, that's a far away away, right? And what we want to do is make sure that we're building in new habits. And to do that, we can just start with really small bite-sized pieces. So basket, basket weaving is totally fine if that's the bite-sized piece that you can do, right? And I didn't learn to weave baskets um, by basket making. I learned by basket weaving. So I learned, you know, I had we took classes where the materials were already provided, and I learned those techniques. And then once I knew how to weave things, that's when I started experimenting with plants I found in my own environment. So again, it's just, you know, whatever is inspiring to you and whatever the baby step is to get you started on that journey, to move your hands and to craft and sculpt and do something with them um, that is creating a kind of thing, not necessarily like writing on a piece of paper or typing on a computer or swiping on a uh, phone. I'm talking about specifically using your hands to create a tool or to create an item that you can use for something and that if you can make it from natural materials all the better if you can do it from start to finish all the better but start where you're at and don't feel like um, you have to be at the end already it's certainly not where i started um so 
the next level, let's see this. The, those are basically my top uh, three things. I think a sort of fourth one that maybe could be the first one too is just psychological attitude. Like if you were to open a book on survival skills, um, you would see attitude as like the first survival skill. And that's because how you see things is going to affect how you do them, how you live through them. And people who have a, who are able to maintain a more positive attitude are going to be the ones that make it through something the longest, make it through hardships the longest. And so just investing in a positive attitude, uh, as annoying as that is for me, because I'm somebody with a lot of angst, um, you know, being conscious about how I'm, uh, moving through the world, you know, um, I've noticed there's like people who are just sort of happily moving through the world and there's people who are sort of have negativity bias I've learned as a thing. And so, you know, I think I'm prone to a sort of negativity bias. And so knowing that, what are the tools that I can have to transform that? There's a really great book that I'm sort of in the middle of right now too, called survival psychology. That is basically about a lot of this kind of stuff. And although I don't think that, um, we need to be thinking about survival skills all that much survival psychology can be extended to sort of the long emergency right where collapses isn't necessarily something that's going to happen overnight there will be overnight um moments of the collapse where you know a weather storm might take out the grid uh you know on economic hardships might you know, the stock market could crash or something, right? Like there are things that can happen overnight to transform societies. Um, but overall, the collapse of civilization on the whole is going to be decades or even hundreds of years long. So the idea of surviving the collapse of civilization isn't really the necessity, but it is um, on a day-to-day -day basis, the kind of survival, surviving the each new challenge as it arises. And that's, to me, the sort of important thing of thinking about survival psychology is how do I face each new challenge as it arises? And every day, in a sense, can be a new challenge. And so what are the ways that I can maintain positivity? Um, I, think the, I think the most useful way of maintaining positivity is found in uh, braiding sweet grass the Thanksgiving address, which is a Haudenosaunee tradition that they have offered to the world to uh, essentially appropriate <laughs> to use, is basically a, a tradition of gratitude and feeling grateful. And when you sit and consciously, uh, you know, I've known about long before braiding sweetgrass, this was taught to me as a teenager at Wilderness Awareness School um, by Jake Swamp, who is a Haudenosaunee man who came there and taught it to that school to use. And it's essentially a, a way of framing and generating positive feelings in your body around uh, the environment that you're in. And just being able to say thank you and feel gratitude toward all of the elements of creation around us. Uh, it both connects us to creation and generates a positive attitude around our place in it. Uh, I, I can't really get into it here because it's a really long and extensive um, process, but I recommend braiding sweetgrass for the chapter that Robin Wall Kimmerer um, talks about it. It's a really beautiful cultural practice that I've had the pleasure of being part of my life for over 20 years now, um, and I really love it. A recent one I've discovered is this thing called the Duchenne Smile, and um, <laughs> it's basically like when you quote-unquote smile with the eyes. Um, they've found that you don't even have to consciously be smiling per se, but if you were to just like bite down on a pencil across your mouth where it's you know sticking out on either side of your mouth, uh, it forces your cheeks up into the Duchenne smile. And what they found is even just like biting on a pencil has been shown to um, reduce stress levels. So the physiological response of that uh, position of the mouth and the cheeks and the eyes 
just that position alone causes a chemical reaction physiologically in the body to reduce stress. Um, fascinating, right? But if you are to consciously think about it and consciously also feel the feelings of happiness, they've found that that increases even more the stress reduction response. So it's this sort of thing where, you know, I just, I, when you're feeling angry and down and for, for me anyway, I'm walking around and I see people just kind of walking around smiling. I think, ah, fuck you, you know, <laughs> um, but I've been lately adding this practice of the smile of the Duchenne smile where I will just, if I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling that potential for negativity bias, especially when I'm like driving and I'm getting like some road rage, I'll just like make myself smile. Uh, and just maintain it and think about how silly I look. And then that makes me smile even more because I'm laughing at myself, which then makes it even more authentic and makes it work even better. Um, <laughs> and again, it's just how many techniques are there out there for maintaining a positive attitude? There's so many. And I feel like that's not, um, people tend to not think of that as a skill. They tend to think of that as personality. And I think that that's, I would challenge that. I would, I would challenge that. I think that obviously all of those things are interrelated, right? But that, um, but, but that maintaining a positive attitude can become a skill if you have that intention and understand psychologically how to make that happen for yourself. And then the triggers that you can use to do that, like smiling or whatever, Thanksgiving address, gratitude, feelings of gratitude, you know, um, conjuring up positivity even when it is really annoying and you don't want to do it um and sense of humor i think too it's not just about you know feeling happy or whatever right it's not that it's feeling positive energized motivated grateful um and having that sense of humor and humility right that's humor comes from humility and so i think being able to like laugh at yourself laugh at the situation especially when it's really hard there's nothing you know being able to laugh um, is so important. And so being able to maintain a sense of humor, even in the darker times, is very important to long-term successful survival. Um, and again, that could be number one, right? Because that's uh, that's a whole framework, attitude, social. And that's something you can do for yourself. Whereas the social structure, building social, you know, um, is obviously super important as well. So those are kind of four things. The fifth one, um, the fifth one might be to uh, dismantle infrastructure that is in the way of rewilding. And what I mean by that is essentially uh, what is preventing biodiversity from happening? What are the barriers that civilization has created that is preventing growth? And the easiest example is like the sidewalk or the, the driveway in your house where they've literally poured concrete over soil that could be growing plants that could be pulling carbon out of the environment and storing it out of the air and storing it in the ground. Um, not only is a is a concrete slab destroying the potential for carbon to be pulled out of the environment, it is in of itself a heat sink because it's solid stone that is now absorbing heat from the sun and generating it or emanating it for a long time. So, you know, tear up the streets is my, my fifth one. Um, but that's really just a metaphor, right? That's not necessarily literal. I mean, you could literally do that. Uh, there are organizations now that that assist in in doing that in certain pl places and people's driveways and um, but what other kinds of barriers are there that are preventing life from living and growing? Um, and then the opposite end of that coin is what can you do to promote more life? Or maybe that's the whole thing. What can you be doing to encourage biodiversity? Like stop mowing your lawn and uh, let it grow until fire season and then cut it because it's a fire danger. But, you know, let the lawn grow. Let the bees get their nectar from the weeds, the so-called weeds growing in your yard. There's a million things that we do on a daily basis that are preventing 
um, biodiversity and biomass from accumulating. And that to me is one of the bigger questions around rewilding is how to, how to get out of the way, how to, how to get civilization out of the way in whatever means we have and are available to us. So those are the top, my top five. Um, and I hope that doesn't ruin my non-prescriptive rewilding uh, <laughs> for anybody. Um, the next question here is, what is your favorite part of rewilding? I don't know. This is a really hard question, actually. Um, it seems like a softball question, but it's actually really hard just because the the word favorite is uh, challenging for me. <laughs> uh, it's, again, it's just kind of too complex to say I have a favorite thing uh, or I have a best friend, right? Like that's, th there's just so much complexity in all of that, in all of these relationships that it's really hard to say one thing or the other. I can share a few things that I really enjoy. Um, you know, what put me on the path to rewilding was really the, the discovery that most of what I had been told growing up and that what most of people believed about humans, about civilization was a lie. And when I was 16 or even younger, I think I was 15, I watched or yeah, I, I watched Terminator 2. And, you know, at the end of the movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger says, it's in your nature to destroy yourselves. And I remember thinking, that's not true, but why does everybody believe that? And I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I'm going to figure out why, why this, where this came from. And that's what really started me down the journey of rewilding was, was being like, I don't have an, it's in, not in my nature to destroy humanity or to destroy the world. Like, I don't want to do those things. I feel like I'm trapped and that I don't have a choice. And that's how I ended up doing rewilding. And so for me, um, the, the parts that are the most enjoyable are those aha moments of discovery, which there's just so many to have because the more you understand the picture, the more complex it gets. And you're like, oh, this part is connected to this part and this part's connected to this part. And just when you think you're starting to figure out you, you know, you get a soft, uh, curveball thrown at you or whatever. Right. Um, and new information comes up that challenges some of the older stuff, but also add, doesn't necessarily negate it, but adds complexity. And so trying to figure out this lens, what is rewilding? What is rewilding? That to me is the, um, the most fun part of all of this is just the, the mythological exploration. And then of course, um, communicating those ideas to the world. So I was recently chatting with um, a friend and I was basically talking about how I feel like I'm a performance artist and that everything I do is essentially some kind of performance. Even just like being on a podcast is a kind of performance art. And ever since I was a child, like five, you know, um, I loved to perform and I loved stories and I was obsessed with movies. I was going to be an actor. I was going to be a director. I was going to be a screenwriter. Um, and I think my mediums of storytelling have changed over the years, but really when it comes down to it, I feel like I'm a, I'm a performance artist and the performance art is a story, a kind of storytelling. And so for me, rewilding is the most important story to be told and to be uncovered. And um, I think that's my favorite part because that's just who I am. That's intrinsically. Um, aside from that, I really love learning to garden and basically all the things I was already talking about. I'm a social person. So all the top five things, each, each of those I have my own favorite parts of, right? I'm a basket weaver. Um, I love connecting with materials with my hands. I love um, making stuff. It's really satisfying when you learn something new and you're able to then replicate it until you gain fluency. Like having fluency in something is just one of the most satisfying feelings. And especially because it's hard to learn new things. At least for me, it, it was hard to learn basket weaving. It was not something that I just picked up. And so those hard won skills, those things that take time to develop the, the feeling of the, the, um, 
yeah, just when you complete those those things and you and you have them uh, to hold in your hands, like when I finish a basket, that feeling of like I did this and I'm fluent in this, and um, it just feels really good. <sighs> okay, what are my favorite books? So I like this one because I'm always telling people like my top five just to limit it, but I'm gonna go beyond that. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you twenty titles right now. Um, my top five. Uh, these are the books that I'm just basically like, uh, everybody should read all of these. I mean, I'll, honestly, all 20 of these would be great for people to read, but, um, you know, not everybody has that much time. So my favorite books of all time, there's a lot of them. There's way more than 20. These are just the ones I thought up off the top of my head. So I thought, oh, these must be my favorite books because they're the ones that popped in there. That might not be true. <laughs> um, but let's say the top five are Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. That was the book that completely transformed me as a teenager and um, deeply entrenched me in the rewilding path, although we didn't have that word back then. Uh, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, You know, I think the greatest part of that book for me was none of the information, and it was new. I've been, you know, learning from Native people and, and participating in Native studies for over 20 years. So I didn't um, particularly learn anything new in that in that book. Um, what was new to me wasn't the specific content of, of what Robin Wall Kimmer was talking about. What was new to me was her voice as a mother and as a native mother and a scientist, like bridging all of these different things. The way that she crafted the content together was just so beautiful and awesome. And a lot of people don't know most of the content in that book, and it was not in one place before. So bringing all of those things together in one place and from the perspective of a Native mother was just, uh, I mean, it's a revolutionary book. Absolutely. Um, the next one would be Unlikely Peace at Kuchumakaik by Martine Prechtel. I mean, anything by Martine Prechtel is just amazing, and everybody should read it. I feel like the reason why I pick Unlikely Peace is because it's about, from my perspective, <laughs> the way I look at that book, it's about the sort of Pandora's box of agriculture that's been opened all around the world by many different people and how to deal with those challenges. And the, not agriculture, but mo- mostly domestication and rewilding and how different cultures have had different kind of ideas around those practices of how to um, live with this problem that we have now of domestication or this this very uh, potentially destructive tool. Um, I love that. So that, that's what that's about. <laughs> uh, Sand Talk by Tyson Young Caporta. I just finished that book. It's amazing. It's like a, um, essentially it's like a rewilding anti-civ book from the perspective of an indigenous Australian. And, all of the, you know, again, it was a thing where I knew a lot of the content, but the framework coming from um, the, the Aboriginal framework of his culture as a way of presenting the information was just phenomenal. And um, I'm looking forward to like actually rereading that book several times. Uh, the fifth one in my top five is Beyond the War on Invasive Species by Dao Ryan. Um, I already mentioned it earlier. The invasive species is such a controversial topic. I highly recommend reading that to sort of dismantle that idea and gain a deeper understanding of ecological systems in general, and then also learn about um, some ways of perceiving invasive species as a way of managing them, which there was another book that people recommended I read, um, The New Wild. It's not in any of, I don't actually recommend that book at all. I have it. Don't recommend it. I recommend Beyond the War on Invasive Species. And that's because New Wild is basically like, well, invasive species are fine. It's not a big deal. Just forget about it. They're here. Get over it. Uh, That's kind of the vibe. Beyond the War on Invasive Species goes in depth on different analysis, uh, on different, you know, ideas around ecological systems and then how humans integrate in them and manage them. And I just think it's a much more practical 
deeper reflective look at invasive species than just like, oh, whatever, they're here. Fuck it. Forget about it. I think there's a lot more to be said, <laughs> especially as rewilders, especially as um, understanding that wildness isn't untrammeled by man, is that there is no such thing as wilderness without people, right? And that people have an impact. So what can our impact be? The new wild doesn't go into that at all. It has a sort of old school, in my pers- from my perspective, an old school perception of wild meaning untouched by people. Like, well, they're here. Who cares? Forget about it. Don't worry about it. Whereas Beyond the War on Invasive Species is much more hands-on and much more human in that way. So the next tier down from there, the next five, are Against the Grain by James C. Scott. Just a really great book on the history of the state and agriculture and monoculture and the sort of long-term tension between um, pastoralists, agriculturalists, and so-called barbarians. Highly recommend that book. Uh, the next one is The Collapse of Complex Societies by Joseph Tainter, which um, is a very technical book, but uh, it it sort of frames why and how collapses happen because of the access to energy and resources that a particular society has. So, you know, examples are, you know, people think that, well, this society collapsed because there was a war or this society collapsed because there was climate change or this society collapsed because there was a pandemic. But when we look at the long term of history, every society has overcome those things at different points in time. So it's not that it was that one thing that caused the society to collapse because why did they weather it before and not this time? So what was the underlying factor? And the underlying factor is almost always energetic inputs. And so the collapse of complex societies essentially puts forth the theory that energetic inputs or diminishing returns are the main factor in the collapse of a society. Um, And they focus on, quote unquote, complex societies, also known as civilizations, rather than small scale societies, which are also susceptible to collapse for the same kinds of reasons, um, which they talk a little bit about in that book. But I recommend that book because it's just such a... uh, a great way for people to understand the long, like why, <laughs> why societies collapse. It's just, um, and it's not like, oh, a pandemic or ooh, warfare. It's specifically because they didn't have the energetic inputs to resist or um, move past whatever conflict or challenge arised in that moment. They had reached the point of diminishing returns. They were no longer getting the energy out of their society and i mean that like energetically specifically like um fertility of the land uh oil you know wood charcoal like literal energy to produce the kinds of technologies and infrastructure and administration required to withstand things like a pandemic or warfare or whatever um the material resources were in a diminish a state of diminishing returns really good book It's essentially like the math of why societies collapse. Um, The next book is Questioning Collapse, which is a book response to Jared Diamond's book, Collapse. Questioning Collapse has many authors. It's written by a collection of archaeologists and anthropologists working in the specific areas that Jared Diamond used as data to back up some of his claims in the book Collapse. And Questioning Collapse is essentially a book written by actual anthropologists uh, you know, Jared Diamond is a geographer and a gallbladder specialist. He's not an archaeologist or an anthropologist and therefore doesn't have the sort of um, anthropological ethics that are taught today. Not that all anthropologists carry those ethics, obviously not, but that there are sort of um, a deeper ethical framework of questioning cultural bias that Jared Diamond does not have and is very prevalent in his books. And so Questioning Collapse kind of goes through and talks about all of those biases that Jared Diamond has and then the reality of the situation on the ground uh, and what the data shows. It's a really good book that um, for me was like left me feeling super hopeful in terms of collapse because it's really just, and as this book shows, it's really just transition to a different way of life. And yeah, it can be a, a rough transition for sure. 
but that it's not the end of the world. It's just essentially the end of whatever elite class <laughs> was existing prior to the collapse. Um, so questioning collapse, yeah, highly recommend that one. And then Dirt, the Erosions of Civilizations is a really good one just about um, essentially like that diminishing returns, but how it is coming from the um, fertility of soils and how civilizations in particular states uh, you know, will burn through their soils and when their soil is no longer fertile, collapse. And so dirt, the erosions of civilizations, kind of examines all these different civilizations around the world and how their soils were depleted because of their agricultural practices. Um, so that's a good one to kind of follow up, you know, questioning collapse and the collapse of complex societies. The fifth one in this subcategory here then is um, Paradise Built in Hell. <clears throat> Paradise Built in Hell is by Rebecca Solnit. And it's just a book about um, like seven major disasters that happened around the world and the amazing communities that evolved or, or developed um, to respond to the crisis. Organically, anarchist communities arise to meet the challenges of the community. And it's just a really hopeful book. Uh, it shows you a lot about how humans actually work in a type of overnight collapse. It's not necessarily geared toward the long emergency or the longer collapse, which is where questioning collapse comes into play. <clears throat> um, but it's just a really good kind of look at how communities will adapt and evolve rapidly to meet the needs uh, of the members or even just communities being created. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's again, it's another really hopeful book around those concepts. Then I have a list of five books that are more geared towards um, applied rewilding and not just sort of the theories and the, the social constructs or narratives around rewilding, but the actual like putting it into use. Um, Tom Elpel's Participating in Nature is my favorite ancestral skills book. It has been ever since I saw it 20 years ago or whatever. Um, it's just such a beautiful simple book that encompasses a lot of um it, it's just i think it's just the best book on the subject i love tom elpel he's a sweet person um and his work all of his books are just great they're not really about hardcore survival they're just about practical ancestral skills um and i just i've always appreciated his work so participating in nature is my favorite sort of introductory book on survival slash ancestral skills and then tending the wild by m cat anderson is a really good book on how to have a reciprocal relationship with landscapes as a so-called hunter gatherer or horticulturalist so it's basically about like land management practices among non-agricultural peoples um, or what we've been, what we would label as agricultural peoples. It's specific to California in terms of the culture of study, but the practices found in that book are found all over the world. So even though it's specific to California, it's still relevant to anywhere you go in the world um, because it's, it's overall the same kinds of management practices. You would just be doing them in a different place with different plants, but there's analogous plants in your place that would match the ones that are in California. So I highly recommend Tending the Wild. Um, another book I love in this in this is Food Not Lawns. It's a permaculture community building book. And it's just a great, again, sort of intro to, to permaculture. It's an intro for people who live in the city to get rid of their lawns and how to start gardening and different things. It's got It just covers so much stuff. And um, it's got fun little graphics and illustrations in it that I've always loved. Um, so yeah, food not food not lawns. And then um, for edible wild plants, I recommend any of Sam Thayer's books or all four of them. He has I think four now. Um, and the reason all four is because a lot of the plants are in certain areas in the world and not in all areas of the world. So. Um, they're kind of general wild food guides. Like some of his books have plants that are don't grow where I live, but most of them do. And I recommend his books.
to get into wild food. I would also recommend Doug Doyer's um, Foraging the Pacific Northwest because it's got a lot of indigenous perspectives woven into it, including how to a section that each plant has called Future Harvests, which uh, includes how to harvest the plant in a regenerative way to continue its existence instead of just thinking about it as extraction. I wish Sam Thayer would include some of that stuff in his work. It's not really his thing, so not a big deal. The reason I wouldn't recommend Doug Doyer's book over those is just because Doug Doyer's book is so specific to the Northwest. Um, anybody living in the Northwest should get that book over Sam Thayer's books. Uh, but if you're just starting out anywhere, if you were to read Tending the Wild and then also have Sam Thayer's books, I feel like that would give you sort of the framework to kind of think about future harvests. Uh, the last book in this in this is uh, Baskets from Nature's Bounty. Of course, I'm a basket weaver, so I love baskets. And I think that book, Baskets from Nature's Bounty, it's out of print, but it's got um, it's just got a lot of great uh, pictures and illustrations on how to start weaving and the, the three different styles of weaving and how to get into it and all the different random materials you could use. It's just sort of like you're all um, a basic basket book to make baskets from anything anywhere and i just i love it it's it's definitely my favorite basket book i carry it around with me sometimes <laughs> i think i think the first time i got it i i had i posted a picture on social media of me like sleeping in bed reading it or so you know with it on my face or something because i just love it so much um and then the last five books i i have on here are for are health oriented and i I always have a caveat before I do anything that's health related just because it's so individual and um, uh, it it's for me, there's like the quick fix in rewilding doesn't have a systemic transformation. And to me, rewilding is a systemic transformation. So when people talk about like rewilding their health, oftentimes that is framed in a way where they're not actually questioning civilization and they're just utilizing things from prehistory to make captivity more comfortable for themselves rather than break free from captivity. So when I frame health, what I want you to think about is I'm not wanting you to feel more comfortable in captivity. I'm wanting you to feel more comfortable so you have more time to try to escape from captivity. I want you to be so feeling so good and inspired and healthy that you're stoked to be tunneling out from the prison of civilization. That's my goal, not so that you're like, well, I feel fine now. Why should I try to escape? So with that in mind, <laughs> there are five books I recommend. Um, Move Your DNA by Katie Bowman. Super, super good book just about movement and um, and how important movement is to our health and well-being in all kinds of ways. The next book is Why We Sleep. I don't have it in front of me and I forgot the author's name, but Why We Sleep, amazing book about how important sleep is and all of the things that you can do to increase your sleep and make it better. The third one is The Hungry Brain, which is all about um, dopamine and um, the lipostat or like how your brain regulates body weight in different ways. It's, it's amazing. It's basically the most contemporary neuroscience on uh, body weight. And of course, I'm obsessed with the concept of starvation and calories now after watching alone and thinking about collapse and famine and all these things. So understanding um, you know, what our bodies need in order to function is uh, paramount to me in terms of understanding what calories to go for in the environment and why and how that's important. So the hungry brain doesn't exactly touch on those things specifically, but that's kind of the core of the book is understanding the calories and the brain and how the brain um, functions in terms of body weight. Uh, then I have Breath by James Nestor, which is all about breathing and how important breathing is in all these different ways. Um, you know, I think like the being able to quote unquote hack into your nervous system, I hate that word, but how to, how to control your nervous system is really connected to breath. And that's, of course, something known through meditation and things like that. Um, so when we're talking about this attitude, having a positive attitude, being able to control your breath, super important to maintaining a positive attitude, as well as, um, you know, 
being comfortable in environments and and all these different things. I think breath is sort of a a really core component to psychology. And so that's an important one. And then the last book on my list is Atomic Habits, which is basically how to create new habits and the science behind new habits. It's called Atomic Habits because the main premise of the book is that habits start to form on an atomic level. So you have to start with small parts and build on those parts. Um, that's sort of the, the, <laughs> the summing it down into a sentence or whatever. But um, there's a lot of really good science in that book about how to create good habits, what you consider good or the habits that you would desire and how to diminish the habits that you do not want anymore quote unquote bad habits. Um, and I just, I've really utilized a lot of the science in that book to develop better habits for myself or not better, but those, the habits that I want. And I highly recommend that book as well. Um, funny that it's the last one when it could actually just be the first, the very first one on this entire list, because if you can't even read a book, if you don't have the habit, then how are you going <laughs> to get all the way down to that one? That's going to teach you new habits. Um, so maybe, you know, again, in terms of attitude, starting with something like a book like Atomic Habits to just kind of get in the habit of reading more or whatever it is of practicing more, um, that might be the one. I think that's all the time I have for patron prompts now. I think we've already been, t been talking for an hour here, just those three questions. So we'll go ahead and leave it at that. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for listening. And if you want to sign up to my Patreon and give me some support for this podcast, that would be fantastic. You can just donate a dollar a month or, or a little more if you like. <laughs> of course, I would like that. Uh, but if all you've got is pocket change, you know, I want this podcast to be accessible. So putting it out there for just a buck a month, um, you know, if, if that's all you got, that would be awesome. I would really appreciate any bit that people have to help me keep going with this project. It's super important to me to keep getting these ideas out here. And um, yeah, thank you so much for your support and we'll catch you on the next one.